Thank you for downloading this podcast from The Reedy Clubby Show on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more, please go to 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Chris Smith, good morning. Welcome to the show once more. Good morning. You want to talk about lightning, don't you? Uh, and and, and <laughs> climate change looking set to increase the rate of lightning strikes around the world? Well, there's a piece of research out this week which looks pretty interesting because there's a, a guy called David Romps who has published this paper in the journal Science where they have logged where every single lightning strike happened during the year 2011 across mainland USA. They did this using a network of sensors that whenever there's a, a lightning zip kind of zapping down onto the Earth's surface, it produces a little burst of radio waves which you can pick up and they can triangulate where those radio sources are coming from to plot the locations of lightning strikes. They've then married those lightning strikes up with the temperatures and also the amount of energy in the atmosphere and this has enabled them to predict that for every one degree rise in temperature you get 12% more lightning strikes at least for the US, it's probably generalizable to the whole world. And the point they're making is that if global warming goes the way we see it playing out, within 100 years, what we're going to see is perhaps 50% more lightning strikes. And this is important because not only does lightning ignite 50% of the wildfires, certainly in America, but probably elsewhere in the world, it also obviously kills people. But lightning has a really important impact on the atmosphere because when you deploy that much energy down through the air, it drives reactions between oxygen and nitrogen, producing these oxides of nitri- nitrogen that are, in some regards, pollutants, but they are also very important as greenhouse gases in their own right, so they could accelerate the whole process of global warming. Oh, right. So this is an important addition to our, our knowledge that we, we had not really understood before. Lightning could become a lot more common if global warming goes the way we think it will. All right, uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, Johnny in Yesteras, good morning. Hi, Ro. Yes, Hi, Chris. Uh, Morning. My queen had a stroke and uh, she had a mitral valve replacement. The doctors told her that uh, her brain, uh, brain cells on the corresponding side are dead. Now there's a pearl called the Lazarus pearl, also known as Spelnox. Uh, I'd like to know how it can facilitate the regrowth or, or, or maybe new, uh, help to uh, grow new brain cells. Is it possible? I'll listen on the radio, please. Thank you, Hello, Johnny. Very interesting question. I'm very sorry to hear about uh, the predicament you find yourself in, Johnny, uh, for, your, for your colleague. Um, the answer is that we were told when I went to medical school that the brain cells you're born with are the ones that must last you a lifetime. In the last 20 years, scientists have discovered that, in fact, even in a person who's 90 years old, there are still some new brain cells being made in some parts of the brain. The bad news is that those brain cells are only being made in a very small and restricted part of the brain, chiefly the the area called the hippocampus. There are a couple of other places as well. So it doesn't appear that they're a comprehensive replacement of nerve cells, at least in humans. In some animals, they can replace cells in various parts of their body. Humans can't. Therefore, at the moment, what scientists are trying to do is to work out why these new nerve cells are being born in some parts of the brain, how to make more of them survive, and then possibly also use them to replace cells or make up deficits in damaged parts of the brain. The other thing that scientists are trying to do is to make the brain become more plastic again. When we're born, the brain is like a sponge. We learn very, very quickly. We have no problem picking up new information and making new connections and pruning away connections in our brain so that we acquire knowledge. As we get older, probably so we don't lose what we've already learned, the brain becomes much more rigid. It doesn't actually learn things quite so easily, but it doesn't forget things quite so easily too. The downside is if you damage the brain, trying to learn how to get round the problem and adapt to a problem becomes correspondingly more difficult. If uh, scientists can work out, which they think they can, work out how to get the brain to revert temporarily to the state we were when we were born, you might be able to rewire the brain more easily and help people to recover from things like strokes. And a lady called Carla Schatz has recently, in the last month, published a paper from California where she's able to achieve this kind of phenomenon in mice. And uh, the same molecules that make this happen in mice could potentially also uh, exist in humans. So she thinks we might have a way of effectively rendering the brain able to learn and able to adapt much more again uh, just temporarily while the, the chemical was there. So watch this space. All right. Uh, Jerome and Woodmead, good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, 
I was, I was wondering why we haven't got spiders that fly with, with wings and why have spiders in all this time never evolved the strategy of becoming flying predators? That's a good predators, I think. Thanks for the question, Jerome. Nice evolutionary question there, Chris. Uh, the line was a bit bad. Can you just uh, summarize? He was asking, me? why have we not seen spiders evolving, growing wings over time? Well, everything that exists on Earth is the product of evolution and has been shaped by natural selection. So wherever there is an opportunity for something to exist, it will exist and it will diversify, grow, expand. It will multiply and fill that niche because every bit of the Earth's surface, every bit of opportunity has over the millions of years that there's been life on earth been exploited and spiders are therefore the product of the environment in which they find themselves if the environment were to change then spiders would potentially change to adapt to that environment but it, spiders in order to grow wings would have to adapt their physiology to such a huge extent they become more like a fly and at which point well when would they stop being a spider and when would they become a fly so in other words flies are already b very successful at being flies spiders are very successful at being spiders they haven't needed in inverted commas to adapt or evolve in that way so it just hasn't happened it's a bit like saying why haven't humans uh, evolved to be able to uh, uh, swim underwater for two hours like a whale can yeah. well the answer is whales live in the water and it's necessary for whales to be able to hold their breath for a very long time so they can eat. Humans instead have two separate legs, they haven't fused them into a tail, we run around and we've evolved a big brain to enable us to use stealth to catch our food uh, and then go and digest it under a tree, unlike a whale who unfortunately has to sit in the ocean all the time. Mickey and Jericho, good morning. Uh, good morning. And um, May I ask the uh, the scientist, I happened to, to go for a, an operation at the urology hospital. And then I, in my stay there, there was a, a small kid who happened to have uh, three kidneys. And she was being operated upon to remove uh, the third one. All I want to find out is uh, how is it uh, that that kid couldn't uh, survive with uh, three uh, kidneys. Mm, mm. And uh, another question is that, seeing that people are... Mickey, uh, Mickey, struggling. Mickey, I think we're going to stick to that one question, please, because the explanation to that, I'm sure, will be fairly detailed, uh, Doc. Okay, the kidneys are produced early in development, and they develop one on each side of the body from structures called paraxial mesoderm. And normally this condenses into blobs of tissue which then form a kidney in the right place on each side. But sometimes the blobs of tissue don't condense into one single blob, sometimes they actually condense into a couple of linked up blobs. And this can produce a kidney with almost an accessory kidney, a second kidney stuck on the side of it with all of the plumbing and that kind of thing. And in even rarer cases you can have something called a horseshoe kidney and this is where the kidney starts on one side of the body, goes up like a, a, a horseshoe, right over the midline, above your belly button, and then down the other side, so you have one giant kidney. These things are very rare, but sometimes they're completely healthy, people don't necessarily have a problem, and we never know about them, and it's only often when people develop a disease later in life and go for a scan or people die and then have a post-mortem that these things are discovered. But sometimes they do cause problems, and the reason they can cause problems is that if you have something which is anatomically not quite correct, the abnormal anatomy can cause stasis of the urine because the kidney is filtering blood it is turning blood plasma into urine and that urine contains various waste products and things that your body needs to throw away this in can include calcium if you don't have the urine flowing correctly out of the kidney then you can end up with the formation of stones for instance a kidney stone and this can then cause problems because it be can become infected because it's an abnormal surface and if it becomes infected it can then injure the kidney tissue which then makes the person very unwell so sometimes the best thing to do if you have a kidney that's damaged like that and shrunken kidneys can become more of a problem because they can affect blood pressure and so on sometimes it's safer to remove them if they're not causing any problem and the urine's flowing properly then it's better to leave them alone Leanne in Pretoria, good morning. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, you know, loud and clear. 
Yes, I just want to find out what is a migraine, what causes a migraine, what actually goes on in your brain when you've got a migraine, and how does a microdol help a migraine, and is it dangerous? All right, listen on the radio, please, Leanne. Hello, Leanne. What we think is happening when people have a migraine is that there is an abnormal pattern of activity in nerve cells in certain parts of the brain. You get these depolarizing shifts, as they're called. We think that this abnormal brain activity is then picked up by nerves and blood vessels in the meninges, the layers around the brain, and that what this triggers is a painful dilatation, opening up of the blood vessels in that particular brain area. The evidence for this is that a characteristic classical feature of migraine is an aura prodrome. In other words, before a person develops the the cracking headache and the photophobia and the nausea and vomiting that goes with a migraine, they often say they've got a visual disturbance. It's usually on one side of the visual field because everything I'm seeing on the right is being processed by my left brain and everything I see on the left is processed on the right. So the side of the brain with the migraine, you will experience this funny impact on your vision on the opposite side of your body it's usually wavy lines or colors and very often encroaches on your central vision this we think corresponds to blood vessels around the area of the brain that's affected clamping down or constricting and then after that process for some reason possibly because of the abnormal nerve activity in this part of the brain possibly because of some kind of sterile inflammatory process the blood vessels then open up and it's when they open up and that, you, that they become very pulsatile that you get that throbbing, thumping migraine headache. So the treatments that people can give for migraine, there are some drugs and they're called triptans. Sumatriptan is a classic one. This is a drug which causes the blood vessels to remain constricted by a small amount all the time. So it stops them undergoing this huge vasodilatation. So what you do is when you have that prodrome coming on, and you see the visual disturbance, you take some of this drug and it stops the blood vessel opening up afterwards uh, so much and it stops the pain. That's one approach. There's also people investigating electrical treatments. There was a study published in the Lancet Medical Journal a few years ago with researchers using a very powerful magnet. When people experienced the onset of a migraine, these visual disturbances, they zapped the back of their head with a very powerful magnet and about half to three quarters of the patients then didn't go on to develop a very bad headache. Mm. And the interpretation is that the magnetic field, because nerve cells are electrically active, if you uh, expose them to a very powerful magnetic field, this can reset the electrical activity of the nerve cells, abolishing the process that was going to kindle and accelerate and become a migraine. So that might be another thing to consider. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. I think after what happened in Parliament yesterday, we all need one of those magnets here in South Africa. Apologies for cutting your time short, but thank you very much for rolling with the punches. You're most welcome. Good to have you on. He'll be back with you in a week's time.